Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Capstone presentations. Um, our first presentation is from Lindsay Smith, um, and she will be giving her presentation. I am going to turn my video off um, and I'm going to mute myself just so that it goes directly to you while you're presenting, Lindsay. Um, so you can share your screen when you're ready and you could get started. Okay. Let's see. Does that work? Um, let's see. Can, is, can anyone see my screen? <laughs> Can't tell. Okay. All right, everyone, um, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate this. I know this isn't the way that we all wanted this to go about, but I'm really grateful that we're able to actually have the presentation. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about brain development in ages 0 to 3, as well as the external impact of domestic violence on that development. Uh, when I started to do this presentation, my mentor, Lynn Landry, was really helpful in helping me focus my presentation. I was kind of didn't know what I wanted to present really for which stage of development. So I could go through uh, newborn, toddler, adolescence, or adulthood. And I really thought it'd be interesting to focus on the first stages, so brain development in children, the very first three years of development. So I just wanted to share a quick uh, video that will just introduce um, parts of the development and who's really how this age and era is really important in development. So here we go. In the 1900s, a parenting manual recommended never hug and kiss children, never let them sit in your lap. If you must, kiss them once on the forehead when you say goodnight. Boy, how things have changed. A robust body of research has confirmed what parents have always known by instinct, that it is precisely these everyday moments, showing affection, comforting, and playing with young children, that build strong, healthy brains. The first three years of a child's life are uniquely important because this is the most sensitive period for brain development. The experiences a child has during this time will shape the architecture of her brain and build the connections that allow her to develop important lifelong skills like problem solving, communication, self-control, and relationship building. New brain connections are forming at a rate of 700 every second in response to the baby's experiences out in the world. These connections help the baby learn the essentials to survive and thrive within her family, community, and culture. It's the quality of a baby's relationships that has a major influence on which brain connections take place and the strength of these connections. So I just want to stop it there. It's just a nice introduction to what I'm going to be delving a little bit deeper into with my presentation. So I thought it was interesting to start off with why are the ages zero to three so important? So some key issues or some things I'm going to be talking about are starting off with those experiences. The language exposure, relationships, and communication that the children face are really important in how the brain develops and how different connections form in the brain and how they're able to grow emotionally, physically, and mentally. And this can help with their social emotional state. And sadly, domestic violence is a very large external impact that can hinder on this development and how their brain architecture really forms. So these experiences can cause for more connections in the brain, which allow them to be more responsive to their environment. It, their brains are very plastic, which means they can be very much shaped by what's around them. So they're kind of like a sponge. They're able to absorb what's around them and really take it in. So the brain really starts to form these connections between synapses and their neurons. Um, the connections are also really important in how they can have motivation in themselves, their self-regulation with like their emotional state, 
um, communication, relationships with others. So even though it's a very early stage in development, it's very vital for how they grow in the future. So this, in these early stages of development, you can see that the neurons, almost all of them are developed at birth. So you notice that all of, there's so many things and so many connections that can be occurring at this time because they're so vulnerable to what's around them. At age three, there are twice as many synapses in the brain than it would be in adulthood. So it shows that their brain is very active and so many things um, like speech or relationships can really impact how their brain makes those connections. And these connections can form a lot faster in their early adult, sorry, in early childhood than later on in adulthood because some of them are lost actually through what's called blooming and pruning. And blooming is where the brain makes more dendrites and synaptic connections than they actually need to use. And the pruning is when the brain kind of goes through and does, uh, looks at those unused dendrites and synapse, synaptic connections and they might disappear or be replaced depending on the situation the brain uh, or stage of development the brain is in. So all of these factors and development can be greatly impacted by genetic or environmental factors. And I'll be going into more of like the external environmental factors more than the genetic. Some statistics I found interesting were 80% of the brain is developed by age three. So more than 75% of your brain is making these connections due to what's going on around them very, very early on. And even at age five, at 90% of your brain is developed. So that's why it's so crucial to give children a healthy, stable environment where they feel supported and protected so that you're able to have this healthy development in their brains. So as I said before, different external impacts like speech, reading, listening to music, singing, all of these things are making the child's brain have so many different connections being formed and able for them to have different portions of their brain be active. So that really helps them have that sense of like cognitive structure and their brain to be able to form. So as I said, speech sounds and um, language related regions of the brain can be very much active when people are talking, singing to them. So that's why people always tell them to sing to your child or speak to them all the time, even if they're not understanding what you're saying. It's always nice to give the child some sort of response and some sort of emotional connection. And that'll help them to have strength in their uh, synapses and have that connectivity and help them more efficiently use those skills later on, even, if, even though they can't speak or communicate those areas of the brain are being strengthened for when they actually can use it. And when there are more synapses in the brain, then that also means that there's going to be more responsive to what's around them. So that's important to give them those experiences and um, different types of responses so they can have their brain be as strong str as, strong as possible. So in the first year, um, the child can recognize faces. They can really actually start to pick up things once their vision starts to come in. They can start recognizing faces, they can recognize voices. So even though it's very early on in, in their stages of life, they can really start to pick up all of these different types of um, abilities. Um, the cerebellum, one portion of the brain, which helps with your posture and your balance, as well as speech, grows three times during this age um, and during this stage of development, which is really interesting. And the hippocampus, which is related to the emotional and the, the memory portion learning of your brain, also starts to improve just in three months. And as I said, the language can be interpreted, so children can differentiate language very quickly, something that they're familiar with and sees, oh, I'm not really sure about that. So the child can really start to pick up different skills, even though they're not able to respond directly with their environment, they know what what's familiar and what's different to them. So they're able to have that sort of um, understanding of what's around them very early on. Now I'm going to be talking about how relationships are very important in a child's development. Having a positive relationship is important when the child feels, sorry, when the child feels that they are in a place where they feel like they can express themselves or have someone there to support them. Um, that's why it's very important to have a parent guardian, someone to give them that healthy relationship to give them a healthy development in not just their brain, but in their physical um, sense in their body. Um, having good stimuli around them, different experiences can help with how they communicate with not just 
those guardians, but also with people who are around them and how they're able to express their emotions about different things. And having someone there that acknowledges your emotional state, even so young, that helps them with understanding stress and be able to cope with things is they have someone there to help them through different issues that they have. And the presence of the guardian can also help them with how their brain grows because they're able to have a healthy environment for them to work through different issues like and their memory as well as self-control and emotional responses. So it's important to have someone there to watch over them and be able to give them the proper environment so they can have good experiences for their brain to develop properly. Stress is also a large factor in how children's brains develop. There can be positive and negative stress and pros and cons to how the stress can impact the brain. And it's really important to have children experience some sort of stress at all throughout their life. Um, and that'll be positive stress or tolerable stress maybe. Um, it can help them understand it's okay and how to cope with different things and become resilient to certain issues. And having, like I said before, the uh, proper um, guardian or parent there to help them through those issues will help them understand the concept of being resilient and how stressful situations they can get through those situations. And even though they may feel, you know, out of place at a certain time, they know that they have someone there to support them through that issue. So the three different types of stress that I researched were positive, tolerable, and toxic stress. So positive stress would be, for instance, a child's first day of school or the recital, something where they're getting a lot of anticipation for. It's not completely a negative situation, but it's something where they feel it's different and they're not really sure of. So that causes their, you know, their heart rate to go up. And it's something that they can eventually figure out they can get through on their own. So this helps them understand that even though it was some situation where they felt out of place in their they had like butterflies in their stomach. It was something where they were able to grow from that. They saw that they can get through it because they had their parents or guardian there or they had teachers or friends to get them through that. So they're able to have that sort of structure to get them through. Uh, tolerable stress is a little bit more severe where it can be uh, death of a loved one or divorce. So this is a little bit more on um, the emotional stress of a child. It can be a little bit more detrimental if it's a, a long-term type issue but most of the time this is something where they can also teach the children or a child to get through um, a certain issue and understand that they can be resilient with that situation that they were dealing with. Toxic stress, unfortunately, is something that many children all around the world experience, and it could be domestic violence, it could be abuse or verbal abuse, and it can come in all different types of forms, um, but it can be very detrimental actually on their development and how they look at the world and how they actually feel. Um, it can help, it can, sorry, it can really damage their behavior or how they have their emotional response to certain things, how they deal with relationship building, and if they're, depending on what situation they're in, it can cause for different issues in the future, um, could cause heart disease or substance abuse later on if they can have issues with depression, and there's a whole list of things that could really be damaging and children can have if they experience too much of this toxic stress in their lives. And now I'm going to be speaking to the external impact of domestic violence and how that impacts children. Sadly, as many as 275 million children are exposed to um, violence at the home worldwide. And this number is very hard to look at and really just to really comprehend. It's awful how many children experience this, and it's really important to bring that to light to everyone to understand that there's so many people that are facing these issues and how maybe ways that we can help them through this. So domestic violence can act, um, children that are exposed to this at home are 15 more times likely to be physically or sexually assaulted than the U.S. national average. So children that are in homes or places where they are unsafe and they don't have the proper resources and people to go to, they are more likely to be victims of this type of violence and, uh, and different violence and abuse. So it's really important to give resources and have resources in the community to help these children um, get through these types of issues and help them for the future. Having domestic violence can also impact their physical, emotional, and social development with people around them and how they 
how them they themselves are growing. It can be detrimental to their behavior. Sometimes they might have mood change, uh, mood switch, mood changes, and um, really impact their sleep behavior or the, how their emotional distress is and how they cope with different things. So domestic violence is something that can really uh, reach all spans and all aspects of someone's life if they're really experienced if they're really exposed to it at really any age. Um, here are a few images that I found very interesting. So these two images on the top right and the bottom left here are images of children who have experienced domestic violence or some sort of abuse in their um, in their life. And you can really see the difference between what a normal brain scan should look like and one that's experienced some sort of neglect or domestic violence. So um, on this image here, you can see that there are these areas of black and that is basically where the brain is not active. The brain isn't working normally or properly as in this healthy brain here on the, on the left. People need to give their child a proper and safe environment for their brain to grow properly because you can even you can see how much black is showing here that inactive areas of the brain that are not working because they were experiencing or they were exposed to something that hindered to their development in, in, in all. Lastly, in this bottom right image, you can see the different connections in the neurons that are in the brain. Um, newborns, it shows that they're very small amount of connections and just up into two years, do you almost have the same amount of connections in neurons than you do as an adult? So that shows just in those two years compared to basically almost the rest of your life, you'll have that same amount. So it's important to give a child the proper environment and support they need because what they have here at two years old will really propel them forward into adulthood and they'll have the same exact connection almost as they do then. Here's some data from the UN that I thought were really um, interesting and I thought I should mention. So here's the US um, with the number of estimated children who were exposed to domestic violence and it's had a very wide range of 339,000 to 2.7 million children each year and all of these numbers are appalling, but I wanted to bring up what the numbers and statistics are in the United States, as well as how that compares to other countries around the world. So here in Asia, you have the largest numbers here in India with 27.1 million to 69 million children being exposed to domestic violence. And as you look at this image here, which is a map of showing the children's rights worldwide, you can see the correlation between how the rights of children are in each country related to the domestic violence statistics in the last slide. So if you see here in red, it says difficult situation. India is in red and that reflects the very large number that they have there. And here in the United States, we have yellow, which is a satisfactory situation. Um, we still have very large numbers, but you can here see around the world what each country is doing with how they treat children, how they're trying to work with their rights and protect them. Um, domestic violence and education. It's something that you can really see um, an example of how domestic violence can impact children a little bit further down the road past the ages of zero, zero to three. Um, Forty percent of children are seen to have lower reading abilities or have a hard time focusing if they are exposed to violence at home, domestic violence at home. Um, and with that sense of safety being tampered with, it can cause issues for their brain long past the, the time span when they're in childhood. It can really last all the way into adulthood. And as I said, um, very young, you can see, even as a year old, you can see the effects of domestic violence. So when someone says or does something that may not be very appropriate to do in front of a child, it's, they say, oh, they may not know what they, they won't remember this but that's not necessarily true as their brain if it happens continuously will be picking that up and their brain will start to form in a certain way and develop in a certain way based on the um, outside impacts and outside experiences that they have so even though they may not remember or recall exactly what is happening their brain will develop based on what's around them and who's around them to give them their brain development that's occurring and ways that we can help and support these children are through giving them positive role models through maybe a support service or a domestic violence shelter, giving them ex um, different types of resources and support that they need that they may not be getting at home. 
um, some school-based programs. Some places um, have, some schools have programs that can help children have that positive, some sort of positive relationship in their life. It could be with a counselor or, or a social worker um, or a psychologist. Um, to really give them that sense of support and help to really give them the resources they need to move forward. Um, this is a slide I added a little bit later on to my presentation. Um, it came to my attention that due to coronavirus, there have been more cases of domestic violence since the children or women are being, or men are being stuck in a situation where they can't get away from their abuser. And in Charlotte, North Carolina, there was a specific statistic that says 17% um, in, there was a 17% increase in the domestic violence calls that were seen in March compared to earlier on in that year or in this year. And there are many factors that can contribute to what is occurring in the families that are having this domestic violence, um, but most of them are due to many people losing jobs and having that financial struggle. They're not able to go out and find a job and they take it out maybe on their family and the people who are around them. They can't get away from them because they're made to stay home. And even though it seems like some places are seeing an increase in these calls, there are actually some places that are seeing decreases in the amount of calls they're getting, like in larger cities like Los Angeles or New York. And this is due to the fact that people can't actually get away from their abusers, so they're not able to call to get help. So it's important that we understand that even if we're not seeing a high call rate of domestic violence or calls for help, that it, it doesn't mean nothing is happening, that we need to be aware of what's going, around, around, going on around us and understand that we need to always be aware and be there to help. And in our community, we have um, Guilford Youth and Family Services that have been helping women and children, families um, with different help around our community. So we have this very wonderful resource here um, that is here to help us. My mentor, Lynn Landry, is from there. She's very helpful and helped me with a bunch of um, resources that I could help find and a lot of different ways that they help the community. And I also spoke to um, Officer Shove and Steve Wrenchy, who helped me understand how the work, the police department, Guilford Police Department, works with Guilford Youth and Family with the Child Development Community Policing Program. And this program works with Guilford Youth and Family. If there is a domestic violence call that occurs, they can have a clinician go with them and they're able to help with the child if there is one in that situation. So everyone is accounted for and they're able to give them and the people in the situation the most help they can have. Um, so I think that's really important to mention that there are a bunch of resources in our community and people that are there to really ensure that the well-being of our community is being taken care of. And I just wanted to thank you all for coming and for being here to listen to my presentation and I just wanted to bring to light the whole concept of how domestic violence is not just here but it's all over the world happening sadly every single day and we need to be there to understand what's happening and have understand the resources and the people that are there to help them. And uh, I want to thank Lynn Landry. Thank you so much for being my mentor and helping me mm -hmm. through this. And the people, um, Officer Shove and Steve Renchi for our, their interviews and their time for educating me on the CDCP and all the, everyone that was there to help me through this project. Nice job, Lindsay. Okay. Really impressive. I think you did a really thorough job of going through all of the ins and outs of your capstone project. Um, and I really um, think it's meaningful how you put the resources right available um, through the Guilford community, especially with um, your mentor being Lynn Landry right at Guilford Youth and Family Services. So um, excellent, nice job. I'm going to um, open up the chat option to um, our attendees. So for those of you who are tuning in and watching, if you just go to um, the bottom of your screen, right in the middle next to participants, it says chat. Um, and you can put comments or ask questions and I will read those out to Lindsay so that she can answer. And it looks like, um, we have one here from Lynn Landry. It was just a comment. Nice job, Lindsay. Great flow and thanks for the shout out. Thank you. I'll just wait and see if anyone else wants to type questions. And like I said, if you have any questions, I could read them out loud to Lindsay so that um, 
she could answer. Well, I'll start with one while we're waiting for others to, um, to add their questions. But what kind of inspired you to, to study this area? Um, is it anything that's related to um, a career interest or anything that you've studied in school? Um, so last year I did a cap, another capstone on how music impacts uh, one's emotions. So I, that's where I kind of got my whole, um, I guess, fascination with understanding how the brain works. Um, and this year, since we don't have a course at GHS that relates to psychology, I really wanted to delve deeper into something that I was interested in. So understanding about how the brain develops, and especially in children, it really fascinated me because at such a young age, the brain is taking in all of this information and really setting the person up for the rest of their life. And I really took all of the things I learned here and um, everything I learned from speaking to others that I'm going to be studying social work at, in college at Salve Regina. And I really want to take this big step forward and really go into that in this community of helping others and really understanding how I can help people. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that you're doing that because I think you're going to be great at it, especially from seeing your capstone last year on the music piece um, to mental health. And then this year, it's it's really meaningful and truly shows that you you have an insight for it and already some background knowledge that a lot of college kids probably don't even have yet. Thank you. A couple other comments. Um, Kathy Zimpano from Guilford Youth and Family, you did a great presentation. And then Susan Merkel Ward, nice job. I really learned a lot. Thank so you. it looks like you don't have any questions, but oh, wait, one more coming through here. Uh, Susan DeFabio, thank you, Lindsay. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. I was astounded to learn that the neurons of two year olds is practically the same as an adult neuron. Lastly, you'll be a wonderful social worker. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, everyone, for coming. Nice job, Lindsay.